Hello and good evening, everyone. It's good to be here with you once again. It's 8 p.m. UK time, so as you know, it is time to start our event. I do hope you had a good Friday and are ready to learn some more things tonight as well. And as you can see, we do have another special guest with us, and this is Harula Bilali. Hi, how good are afternoon. you? How are you? All good. Happy to have you here with us. And how are you feeling tonight? <laughs> I'm really happy and excited actually to be here with you tonight. That's great to hear. And because greetings we... from uh, Irani Athens today. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining our Stronger Together initiative. And I just want to mention that, as you know, we are here every single day just because we want to support you. We want to answer your questions and we also want to give you the opportunity to meet top fertility experts. And uh, well, as you know, this is Friday. Therefore, that means uh, we are promoting Greece as a fertility destination of 2021. And it's uh, also a pleasure for me to, to mention that uh, Harola is also part of it uh, big she took part of it of course as well as she is also our ambassadors and partner uh, when it comes to the Greece as a destination of 2021 but also you will see that there is a photo of her right in the middle on the left more likely yeah on the left and, mm -hmm. and of course she's been supporting our um, Stronger Together initiative, initiative from uh, beginning this second edition so Harola I also want to thank you for joining our initiative it's a great pleasure to have you on board with us and I also want to thank all of the other ambassadors um, as you can imagine, it's always hard to to be able to support uh, have so many webinars without the assistance of the ambassadors and partners. So huge thanks for that. And well, tonight we definitely have an interesting topic to discuss. And Harola has prepared her presentation on the new parameter you should definitely check after multiple uh, cycles. And before we start with the presentation, I just also want to mention that uh, she, Harula is a molecular biologist specialized in reproductive health. She's also the founder and CEO of Fertisotis, uh, which is a medical pharma company. And she's also a, a member of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, but also ESHRA. So many, many things things she's doing she's a very very busy person and so i am even more happy that you are able to find time and will be presenting for us tonight i will well. miss that for the world thank you very <laughs> and much great to hear. And, and of course as always remember that uh, we will start with the presentation but afterwards it will be time for your questions or anything that you have in mind go ahead type this in Harua will be happy to, to answer them for you. I have no doubt here. And um, well, I guess we can start with the presentation, okay? Okay, thank you, Wonderful. Caroline. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. So uh, I want to welcome everybody here tonight. And uh, it is a real pleasure that I am here sharing with you some uh, latest data regarding um, a subject that uh, is already a hot topic the last uh, decade, but uh, nowadays more and more scientists uh, from different uh, areas of science actually are involved in this specific sector that I'm going to discuss with you today. So, uh, we are stronger together and again I want to, to say a big thank you to um, ivfmedia.org for this support that they give to um, infertile uh, patients all around the globe. And uh, for you, as for every single patient of mine and my colleagues, I'm always Harula. Uh, not Matthew Pulu Bilali, I'm a molecular biologist, as Caroline said, but uh, for me, I'm just a scientist that really want to um, share my uh, science so that I can find solutions and help uh, people with uh, infertility uh, address their problems. This is uh, one of uh, my happiest moments in uh, my profession. It is uh, two years ago in uh, Estre in uh, Vienna that uh, I participated in my first uh, run of uh, five kilometers. It was a charity run of uh, Estre. And I ran for every couple, every woman, every man who is trying to have a baby. And the reason that I'm saying this, it, was, it is because Actually, it is uh, the very first uh, uh, the, the first year 
that uh, I had I started becoming even more curious about the one factor that I'm going to discuss with you today. So let's start with the most challenging question in IVF. Why IVF fails? It is the most challenging question and it's a very frustrating thing because many times you really do not have an answer. May, most of you by now, uh, if you have um, uh, experienced multiple IVF failures, uh, you probably know that age is one of the most important factors that affects IVF. Then along with age, but not only because of age, comes egg quality, bad egg quality can result in IVF failure. Egg quality is not only because of, bad egg quality is not about, is not only because of uh, advanced reproductive age, but you can have bad egg quality because you have polycystic uh, um, ovarian syndrome or you have uh, uh, endometriosis. Uh, you can have an IVF failure because there are hormonal imbalances, because of bad semen parameters, because of chromosomal issues, implantation failure, uh, uterine abnormalities, uh, endometrial thickness problems, because you may experience a bad embryo transfer that can happen as well. Also because uh, the uh, protocol, the stimulation protocol that was uh, 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 used in order to stimulate the ovaries was a bad one or the wrong protocol for the patient. Uh, sometimes IVF can fail because you may have a high body mass index. There may be um, thyroid, thyroid problems that have not uh, been addressed and not solved. Um, there is some conflicting data regarding immunology and natural killer cells for IVF failure. Um, thrombophilia, infections, including infections of uh, the endometrium, and so many other parameters that, uh, frankly, um, many times I am asked by some patients of mine about uh, things that uh, even myself, I do not know how to answer. Because uh, sometimes it's like we are trying to find uh, the most difficult a factor that could probably affect the IVF failure. But in my personal view, after being, um, after being a, a, an infertility specialist uh, for more than 15 years now, uh, I believe that we need, we really need to address all those factors, but many, many times, instead of adding more tests, probably it's a better thing to simplify things a little bit. I will explain. So, as I told you, we start looking for all the factors that I mentioned above, but many, many times, uh, the two main areas that we really forget to consider, and the one new we should start considering more, has to do with stress, because there is data that preventing or decre that there is data that support the idea that preventing or decreasing maternal stressors may have a positive outcome on pregnancy. Also, the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology has released a new set of guidelines which included recommendations for lifestyle modifications for recurrent pregnancy loss patients. And last but not least, the last 10 years, we have what is called the microbiome to be a very important factor about fertility and uh, the success of an IVF procedure. Most of the times when we are talking about the microbiome, we say many, many things about the vaginal microbiome and the endometrial microbiome. But what I want to introduce now as a new parameter that I do believe that every single past patient of IVF should consider checking before starting another IVF procedure is the microbiome of the gut. <laughs> so, what is the microbiome? The human microbiome 
it's considered to be an organ in its own right. It is, simply put, it is all the communities of the bacteria and the viruses and the fungi that live inside our body and on, on our body. The human microbiome is composed of communities of bacteria and viruses and fungi that have a greater complexity than the human genome itself. The human microbiome has an estimated 100 trillion microbes, the bulk of which live, as I told you, in our gut. Large-scale metagenomic projects, such as the European metagenomics of the human intestinal tract and the human microbiome project, have reported up to now 3.3 million unique protein coding genes, as compared with the entire human genome, which has around approximately 23,000 genes. So, these studies have described the beneficial functions of the normal gut microbiota on health down to the genetic level. Why is the microbiome so important? And why should we start considering it more when we're talking about infertility or fertility as well? Because the human microbiome has extensive functions such as development of immunity, you really need a good immune system to support a healthy pregnancy, defense against pathogens, the same reason, host nutrition, including production of short chain fatty acids, important in host energy metabolism, synthesis of vitamins and fat storage, as well as influence on human behavior, making it an, an essential organ of the body without which we could not function properly. So, the microbiome is such an important organ in its own right that can also affect various functions of the human body, including the reproductive function itself. Since 2010-2013, um, more and more data start to present themselves in various clinical trials. And here I share with you uh, the four ones that uh, I found most interesting. So Moreno and Al in 2016 came to the conclusion that while it was one thought that the endometrium was a sterile environment, it has now been accepted that Lactobacillus colonized this region in addition to the vagina. So it's not only that we know that there are, there are some good microbes in the vagina, we know that the endometrium has its own microbiome as well. In a recent study, it was demonstrated that women with Lactobacillus dominated the endometrium undergoing IVF have been shown to achieve higher rates of successful implantation, 60.7 versus 23.1%, and live birth, 558.8 versus 6.75% rates, compared to those with non-lactobacillus dominated endometrium. And the endometrium, in that case, had more Gardnerella, Streptococcus, and other organisms present. 2003, 2003 and 2014, it was mentioned that, moreover, vaginal dysbiosis, please hold this word in your minds, dysbiosis reduces the local defenses against sexually transmitted pathogens and ascensions of pathogens up the fallopian tubes can affect reproductive health. Of course, we need to have healthy fallopian tubes in order to have good reproductive health. And just some months ago, Juan Garcia Velasco and Al demonstrated that lifestyle changes, especially those that affect nutrition, can lead to changes in the gastrointestinal microbiome and could have a positive impact in infertile patients. What is dysbiosis? What is this, this term, which is a Greek term from this and biosis, the, which means but life, but, but existence. <laughs> so dysbiosis is any interruption that occurs in the balance of the microbiota. Um, allow me to say, um, allow me to make 
uh, I like I like Al Rab. <laughs> Excuse me. Allow me to explain to you the difference between the microbiota, the term microbiota, and the term microbiome. The term microbiota refers to the total number of the microbiomes, the total communities of the microbiomes of the microbes that we have in uh, our um, body. Uh, the microbiome refers to them, but also the genome, the DNA, the, the genetic information that all these microbes also have. So, this biosis is defined by an imbalance in bacterial composition, changes in bacterial metabolic activities, or changes in bacterial distribution within the gut or any other organ. The three types of dysbiosis are loss of beneficial bacteria, overgrowth of potentially pathogenic bacteria, and third, loss of overall bacterial diversity. In most cases, these types of dysbiosis occur at the same time. Dysbiosis has been associated with diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, autism, and certain gastrointestinal cancers and infertility. You can see two uh, vectors that show how you have a normal vaginal flora. So when your vaginal has a good uh, amount of um, uh, beneficial microbes, you see this picture here. But when you have vag vaginal dysbiosis and the balance is not correct, then the uh, uh, vaginal environment becomes like that. Also, in the gut and the intestinal tract, normal healthy intestine is like that, but the intestine with the dysbiosis here, you see there are so many less bacteria, and this is what happens for many, many reasons that we're going to discuss just about now. But before that, I really want you to remember this important information that it has been shown that a lactobacillus dominated endometrium in the patients that their endometrium was dominated by, by the beneficial microbiome, microbes, it was these patients had 58.8% versus 6.75% life, life birth rate. And this is something really important that we should keep on in our minds and start thinking very seriously about generally improving our microbiome before any IVF treatment. <coughs> the normal flora of the reproductive tract includes a variety of lactobacillus species which promote a healthy supportive environment for the embryo in the pre and periconceptual period not only by their presence but also by production of lactic acid hydrogen peroxide bacteriocytes antibiotic toxic hydroxide radicals and probiotics do lactobacilli promote a supportive environment for implantation also, on the basis of the role of inflammation in the induction of the progesterone-resistant endometrium, we hypothesize that failure of implantation might be explained, perhaps in part, by alteration in the uterine microbiome in response to inflammation. These are two other important findings uh, back from 2014 that uh, Ido Sirota et showed that the human the endometrial uh, microbiome is very important for two reasons regarding implantation. The first has to do with the procedure of implantation itself and the environment that is created in order for the embryo to find the perfect environment and implant and start the pregnancy. But besides that, besides the perfect environment for the implantation to occur, there is also supporting data that, um, that state that uh, the, a good microbiome, a, 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 a healthy micro, a healthy endometrial microbiome can also uh, alter the hormone levels, the, 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 hormone, the, the hormones that are important 
for reproductive fitness and these are this is estradiol and progesterone and especially progesterone that we need to have a balanced progesterone profile in order for implantation and a successful pregnancy to occur so we now know and it is evidenced and i hope that by now i have uh, persuaded you how important it is the microbiome for reproductive health that microbiome affects people affects us from the day we are born till the day we die it affects uh, fertility via nutrition and fertility via disease because it can promote inflammation and it can also increase other increase susceptibility to other diseases that can also have an, a negative impact on fertility in cells. <laughs> Hold this please, that fertility via nutrition. Let's see what disturbs the microbiome and leads to dysbiosis. So, again, we need to understand that the microbiome is very important for fertility, for good fertility and if it is disturbed so if we lose some of our beneficial flora uh, or the analogy of the microbes it's disturbed this can lead to dysbiosis <coughs> and what does what really disturbs the microbiome and leads to dysbiosis is an improper diet junk food consumption of too much sugar drinking alcohol stress can have a huge impact on the, of the on the microbiome um, use of antibiotics use of painkillers and hormones um, when i wrote down all these main parameters that can affect uh, the uh, and disturb the microbiome and lead to dysbiosis uh, i was thinking ah uh, most of my fertility patients even if the ones that start when they're starting their fertility procedures then their, their ivf procedures they try to eat healthy but at some point they start eating more junk food and uh, sugar or they turn to alcohol especially if they are very stressed and then they take all these antibiotics uh, in the course of their IVF treatment and sometimes they take painkillers because they are in pain because of the uh, stimulation uh, uh, protocols and the stimulation protocols themselves themselves include hormones so hormones and junk food and sugar and alcohol and stress and antibiotics and painkillers gosh I mean you do not need anything else any any other um, any other testing diagnostic testing to confirm that probably that woman's microbiome is uh, affected, negatively affected. So gradually, as I told you, especially after multiple IVF failures, <coughs> couples experience multiple negative feelings and they often worsen their lifestyle and habits because remember, I told you earlier that two things that we keep forgetting about why IVF fails is lifestyle and habits, nutrition, lifestyle and habits. So they often worsen their lifestyle and habits leading to microbiome imbalances. What are the common symptoms of symbiosis, of dysbiosis? A bad breath, an upset stomach, nausea, constipation, diarrhea, difficulty urinating, vaginal or rectal eating, bloating, chest pain, rash or redness, fatigue, having trouble thinking or concentrating, anxiety and depression. So, um, I have started gradually the last couple of months, the more the more that I dip into uh, the science of uh, the microbiome, uh, to start using a new protocol that for every new IVF uh, couple that uh, 
comes to our practice, besides all the tests that I'm taking to assess the more the major the, the first parameters the, the first parameters that I mentioned above regarding the reasons of uh, multiple IVF failures, I started doing a more extended um, lifestyle questionnaire that also includes some uh, parameters that may lead me to uh, the um, uh, conclusion that this woman or even this couple, because uh, dysbiosis can also affect uh, the hormonal imbalances in men, that this couple have problems with uh, their microbiome. And not only the microbiome that has to do with reproductive, the reproductive tract, but also the microbiome that has to do with the gut and the, the, and the intestines. And the reason is because when you have an optimized microbiome, you can absorb all the vitamins that you are taking through your food and your supplements better. When you have a good microbiome, you can have a better psychological resilience. You are more resilient, you are more resilient as a, a person. Uh, you have um, less stress. There, there is so much evidence besides IVF that the microbiome directly affects the brain through the gut-brain axis. And there is so much data supporting this as well that uh, there are now uh, ongoing studies because they know that, uh, pe that um, uh, people with uh, uh, depression and uh, high levels of stress, actually they have a disturbed microbiome, a disturbed gut microbiome. So, if we need to optimize, to optimize a couple before another IVF cycle, my suggestion is that you need to also assess and optimize the microbiome and not only the vaginal one. How can you, how can somebody improve the microbiome? Um, I was asked by uh, one of my patients that uh, live in a very distant island in Greece and especially now with the quarantine it's not very easy not to travel to do uh, more um, specific testing uh, about uh, the vaginal microbiome or even the gut microbiome because there are many tests now that you can really use in order to access how if you have any form of or this BIOS or not. So you know, we really need to make things simple. We need to simplify things. And we need, if we really want to stand next to our patients and really support them, we need to find solutions without always having to test something first. So there are four proven ways to improve your microbiome. And these are proven ways that can improve the microbiome regardless of any testing done. So what do you need to do? And again, I'm saying both for the vaginal and the endometrial, but also the gut microbiome, the gut intestinal microbiome. You need to eat a variety of probiotic foods to boost good bacteria. We need good bacteria, so we find, so the, uh, the body finds a good balance again. Probiotic foods <coughs> contain live bacteria in them. So eating probiotic foods increases the overall communities of beneficial microorganisms. What are the probiotic foods? Probiotic rich foods include yogurt, kefir with live and active cultures. Choose low, of course, no sugar varieties because sugar impairs healthy bacteria as told before. Fermented pickles, sauerkraut, kombucha tea. It's a fantastic um, thing to add in your fertility diet. And apple cider vinegar <coughs> in your salads. Uh, they ask me, um, can I take a probiotic supplement? Of course you can. And I, I really think that every single IVF patient should have a probiotic supplement as well. But besides, it's not only to take things from as a supplement. You need to balance your um, nutrition as well. Because this is how 
biology works. This is how you can really support the whole function of the gut, of your gut and your intestine and uh, your vagina and um, your endometrium. You need to add probiotic foods in your everyday diet. That's the normal routine. That's the, that, that's the normal route and the best routine you can have. Second, add prebiotic foods to feed the gut microbiome. So your gut microbes want food and they want those foods, certain foods called prebiotic foods in order to do all their functions. So prebiotics are foods that fuel the healthy microbes in the gut. These foods are usually high in prebiotic fiber that microbes are going to break down. Prebiotic foods include flax seeds, chia seeds, legumes. I mean, infertility diet should have at least twice a week legumes. Whole grains such as oats, vegetables such as asparagus, artichokes, garlic, and onions. Generally speaking, whatever has good prebiotic fiber inside. <coughs> Three, practice stress management techniques. Stress can really influence the microbiome too. Constantly having high stress levels contributes to a poorly functioning gut. The body's longest nerve, the vagus nerve, goes straight from the gut microbiome to the brain. This is what I was telling you before. <coughs> Research has found that similar to having lots of toxins in your environment, having very high stress blocks the vagus nerve's function. Ultimately, ongoing stress prevents your gut from working the way it should. That means that what even if you have, um, say, a good diet or you are taking uh, um, uh, lots of uh, vitamins, but, you know, I know people that actually are having a good diet but at the same time they are drinking more than they should or they may have uh, all these fruits that are recommended and uh, the vegetables that are recommended and the protein that is recommended but at the same time um, they eat uh, too much sugar because they say okay i'm eating healthy but uh, so i can eat a little bit more sugar so the thing is that Whatever you are eating, if your gut and your intestine do not function properly because of bacterial dysbiosis, then you cannot uh, accumulate all the good nutrients that you need for good fertility. And the fourth and most important is you need to stay, in order to improve your microbiome, <coughs> you need to stay active to keep your body health, healthy to keep your body health. Exercise and physical activity can help your gut, and not only by supporting a healthy weight, but also by positively affecting the microbiome. Even 10 um, minutes of mild walking a day has proven benefits. I think that everybody has 10 minutes during their days to just go out and walk. Gentle activities such as walking, cycling, yoga, or swimming in the summer, or uh, if we are out of this madness of COVID, we can start using swimming pools again, can keep you moving and improve your overall well-being and your fertility. <coughs> so, three months for better microbiome, better egg quality, better sperm quality, hormonal balance, and endometrial health. And the reason, uh, the reason I'm saying three months is because it takes approximately 75 days for new sperm to develop, and it takes appro approximately 90 days for uh, a new egg to completely mature from uh, um, less, um, from an immature state to the uh, ovulate, ovulatory uh, phase. So, <coughs> What you should do, <coughs> excuse me. What you should do, first of all, please stop and take a break. Reassess the situation. <coughs> Organize your medical history. Know your numbers. This is the most important step before any any next IVF attempt. 
Probably the things now are not the same as they used to be, say, two or three years ago. I had this patient the other day. It was the first time that my heart was really broken after a very long time. I mean, my heart every, every time is broken, but this time I was completely heartbroken because she, she uh, asked for an appointment and she came to this appointment urgently on her third day of a new stimulation after uh, having four unsuccessful IVF cycles. And my question, my first question to her was like, was that, uh, why, why are you visiting me? She was not my patient before, she was a new patient. And I said, why are you visiting me now? You're already in your, um, third day of uh, stimulation and she she looked in my eye and she was asking for an answer that she could not and suddenly she just said because probably you know something more than i i don't know already and it it really broke my heart and i'm sharing this because what i told her is i'm not going to tell you what extra you can do this appointment was something like three hours i told her that you need to stop i mean you have to go through this uh, stimulation and uh, uh, complete the cycle that you have started but after that uh, and i hope that she's successful and i haven't heard from her yet uh it was um, um, 10 days ago but if this cycle fails one more time, because this is what she believed that it could happen again, I told her, please stop, take a break, reassess the situation, organize your medical history, know your numbers now, know your FSH levels, know your AMI levels, know the sperm parameters now, uh, see that you're in good health, you have good uh, vitamins, etc. Don't go to the next IVF cycle in a hurry. Okay, second break bad habits and build good ones before assessing the most difficult and the strangest and uh, the most uh, rare uh, reasons that IVF fail. Go back and address your lifestyle, your nutrition problem, your sleeping patterns, think outside the box, ask for help and make a plan to start creating good habits. Good habits that will protect your mental health. Good habits that will bring your sexuality back. Good habits that will help you sleep better and improve your hormonal balance. Good habits that will protect your microbiome. And if you cannot do it by yourself, ask for help and make a plan. Third, personalized the treatment try to understand what is your diagnosis sometimes even after so much testing we miss we still miss the diagnosis and it is especially i believe after 15 20 years of experience in the field of ivf i believe that especially when we cannot really find something obvious and offer a diagnosis to the patient, there is nothing more important that have everything optimized before your next IVF attempt. And this time, what you should also optimize, besides your vitamins and your lifestyle and your exercise regimes and uh, everything that has to do with your lifestyle, is also optimize your microbiome. Also, is the treatment plan clear? Do you have the support needed? I'm telling you this because it's not only to have to do with the microbiome, but there is supporting data, there's so much, so, much, so much data at the moment that support the idea of we really need to go back to the basics. October 2019, 
Fertility and Sterility, our leading magazine, uh, our, our, our leading uh, fertility magazine. Uh, and it is Carlos Simon, one of the most highly acclaimed uh, uh, scientists in the field of uh, assisted reproduction, uh, as an editor of that issue of Fertility and Sterility. And uh, the opening is Preconceptional Care. Do we have to care? So I'm going to read that before I close <coughs> because the take home message is please try to optimize everything before your next IVF cycle, including your microbiome. <coughs> so, timely and appropriate medical care can significantly <coughs> influence the health of a newborn. When considering how to best deliver such care, we must first note that each human represents the result of a balance between nature, genetics, and nurture, and environment. Importantly, while most of our care is centered on in utero development, the preconception period is also a time at which genetic and environmental factors can interact <coughs> to exert effects that ultimately influence the health of the future offspring. In this issue's views and reviews, we provide data to suggest that modern preconceptional care should become a key component of reproductive medicine, not only to improve implantation and pregnancy rates, thus minimizing IV failure, but also to reduce perinatal morbidity and mortality further optimizing the health for mothers and children and setting the stage for the child's adult life. <coughs> the preconception period should be regarded as an actionable window of opportunity for child health promotion, not only because of this gene environment interaction and the opportunity to identify women's genetic risks, but also because it represents a time when women are most willing to abandon unhealthy habits. So, it's the most crucial period, three, three months before another IVF to optimize everything. It is the window of opportunity to improve your lifestyle, to improve your microbiome, to improve your sleep patterns, to improve uh, your exercise regime. And that will have a positive impact on fertility. Closing, I want to share with you my first microbiome and health coaching success story because besides a molecular biologist specialized in assisted reproduction technique, I'm also a registered health coach. Uh, 39 years ago, 39 years old patient with a difficult unexplained infertility, five years of infertility. Uh, this is what she sent me it was kind of birthday present birthday present for me because i'm born uh, in uh, the middle of uh, august uh, my birthday is in the middle of august um so she came with a package of one hundred thousand of uh, results and uh, tests and uh, procedures and blah, blah 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 and with her what i did i said stop we need to reassess the situation. We need to know our numbers. And we started working together, me both as a fertility a specialist, but also a health coaching, also a health coach. And we started changing her lifestyle, her sleeping patterns, her attitude towards life, her happiness, uh, her microbiome, uh, her sexuality, because uh, all these five years of uh, treatments and IVF failures and uh, tests and uh, some doctors saying uh, do not have intercourse, others saying uh, uh, only th th that day is blah, blah, blah. So the thing is that we started uh, improving the basics, vitamins, microbiome, sleep, general health, uh, mental health, psychological health. And she was successful in uh, her first IVF attempt 
in a natural cycle and this is what she uh, sent me in uh, WhatsApp and she says, have we made it? Because she could not really believe that she was pregnant. Yes, call me. So, thank you very much. Um, this, is where, this is where you can actually find me for anything else you may need. And uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for that detail and lots of with lots of useful information uh, presentation brilliant and i loved the ending the success story thank you so much for bringing this to us uh, that definitely sounds encouraging indeed as well thanks so much for this thank you, thank you. I, I, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for having me here tonight yeah no definitely happy and as you can see there are quite a few questions ready for you okay so harula <laughs> i guess we can go ahead with them right okay Perfect. So let me go to the very first question that we have. Um, sorry, <laughs> it's just this is the first one. Can lack of water or dehyd dehydration yes. affect implantation? Yes, of course. Water or it's a thank you for that question. Okay. Um, you know, I'm a maniac, I'm crazy with water uh, because what happens? This is an actually, actually, it's one of the best questions to start. So, um, what happens with uh, dehydration and the lack of water in the body? Apparently, for uh, survival issues, the reproductive system is not the one that keeps us uh, in, in, conditions, in conditions of uh, survival. That is the one that the organ, the organism, um, our body does not really care about. So that comes, you know, uh, from a very old, old, old times ago. So when we are dehydrated and we don't uh, uh, cover the eight to 10 uh, glasses of water per, per day needed in order for homeostasis of our uh, body, uh, actually the water is taken from uh, our reprodu reproductive system and um, so when this happens you have a less optimal environment and also dehydration affects hormonal balance a hormonal uh, the hormonal balance in the body because uh, it's uh, uh, water is very important for hormonal homeostasis uh, so if you do not have uh, enough water in your system then you have hormonal imbalances as well and you don't you really don't need hormonal imbalances when you're thinking about uh, endometrial uh, uh, function and implantation of course so yes I indirectly not directly but indirectly there are at least three different paths that uh, <coughs> lack of water can um, alter uh, endometrial function. And wonderful. Thank you so much for answering that very first question, of course, for your question as well. And uh, there is a follow up, okay, from the very same patient. Is tap water okay? Well, um, that's a great water, that's a great question as well. I mean, I prefer tap water compared to um, uh, bottled uh, water in plastic. I mean, uh, I prefer tap water from uh, a plastic bottle water. But uh, what is best is uh, if you can have uh, a good, uh, uh, you know, filter that uh, takes uh, some of uh, the bad material in the water off. Yeah, of course. But I would not, I would not worry so much about that, really. All right. Understood, of course. Thank you so much for this then as well. And there is another uh, question. Uh, from the very same patient as well. So I'm doing a transfer in a few days. Is it too late to detox? I'm doing it. Is it too late to detox? Um, I wouldn't put so much stress in the body right now. I mean, uh, um, you know, detox is not always something easy for the body because it's a new situation, right? So my advice is that from now on, it's not about detoxing. It's about starting a healthy diet starting a diet i mean there's only one good fertility diet and that diet is 
the Mediterranean diet that has lots of fruit, lots of fruits and vegetables. You know, there has been this great study some uh, years ago that uh, showed that women that ate uh, uh, more uh, fruits uh, are getting pregnant uh, quicker. So fruits, probably because of the antioxidants, even better than uh, uh, vegetables and other uh, good uh, nutritional um, uh, other are other nutritional categories. Uh, they have a very good impact on fertility. So I wouldn't do detox now, but I would start having a fantastic uh, healthy diet to support everything. Also, omega three. I can, I can answer. I can. I can use one more hour to answer this question, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> of course, thank you. Start so a much. good diet. Thank you so much, of course, for that as well. Okay, now we will have two parts of the question. Okay, so this yes. is the first one. We have unexplained infertility. We've had four failed IVF cycles, my own ex and one failed donor ex cycle. I have IBS and wonder if that could have an impact. If so, what do you recommend? And Jennifer has also added, uh, let me just go. I should have added that we are due to another donor cycle in March. So I have a few months to make changes. Great. Uh, well, it also has to do with uh, the age of, uh, okay, IBS is uh, one of uh, the microbiome diseases, okay? So, uh, I would suggest that she is in close, that hi Jennifer, that Jennifer is in close contact not only with her reproductive uh, specialists, uh, but also with uh, her um, uh, doctor that uh, is looking after her for her IBS problems. And I definitely believe that she should uh, uh, allow some changes and uh, increase uh, the health of her gut and um, uh, include all these, the four stages that I recommended about uh, probiotics, prebiotics, uh, about uh, stress um, uh, stress management and uh, a good uh, nutrition and exercise. I definitely believe that she, Jennifer, that you should start uh, a change and have a positive impact on your IBS. I mean, control your IBS the best way that you can. Increase the uh, homeostasis in your microbiome and then do everything. Follow the four, 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 follow the main four stages of in microbiome improvement. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for this then as well. And let's have a look at the um, next question that we have also right here. So I recently had a chemical pregnancy. This was my first cycle. I'm 44, had donor egg that was PGD tested. I have IBD, but wasn't on an immune protocol and had intralipid after my transfer, what else would you recommend for my second cycle? Example, immune testing, hysteroscopy? Okay, this is not a, a, an answer to answer, this is not a question to answer just like that because every time that you go so deep, you really need to have the whole uh, uh, medical history of the couple, but uh, so it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, the right thing for me to say do this or do that without knowing the medical history of such an important uh, issue. But irritable bowel disease we know that has uh, um, that is also uh, has a strong, has a high levels of inflammation, and inflammation is not good uh, generally for the body and especially for uh, fertility. So high levels of inflammation have a bad impact on uh, uh, fertility. Uh, what, I, what I do with my, my patients before any IVF cycle, I have uh, a hematologist that we work closely together. I, I strongly, I do believe that everything should be an expert in their field. I mean, I don't want to do things that a hematologist does or a reproductive immunologist does, all right? So in our team, we have uh, a doctor that before any IVF cycle, 
assesses problems like uh, irritable bowel disease or uh, a celiac disease uh, uh, or other immune problems and we get a very specific protocol for that patient. So, immune testing, yes, I would probably recommend immune testing, but, but not any immune testing. It doesn't mean that because you have this, you should have every kind of immune testing out in uh, the fertility market. You should have a practitioner that can define and specify and personalize what kind of immune testing you may need. Um, hysteroscopy and IVD, I don't know if there is any connection, but uh, generally, uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, and especially if you are doing, you know, on donor eggs and uh, especially if they are PG tested, I mean, you have uh, PGD tested, I mean, you have, uh, you are controlling one part of the uh, implantation, you're controlling the part of uh, uh, the embryo. So, hysteroscopy, by doing a hysteroscopy, you will also assess where the embryo is going to be transferred. So, that would also be advisable as well, but uh, probably your doctor would be uh, most uh, appropriate to answer something like that. <laughs> With my, my patients, hysteroscopy, our patients, in my husband is a medical doctor, he's a He's an obstetrician gynecologist specialized in uh, reproductive uh, uh, medicine. So we recommend, in our practice, we recommend hysteroscopy even for the two, five percent that something may be found uh, in uh, most of our patients, most of the times. All right, excellent. Thank you so much once again for that uh, question and uh, your help with this as well again and uh, as you can see there are thank yous uh, from the patients from san but also from previous patient uh, so thank you for answering good luck uh, and of course good luck always good luck. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm also wearing my lucky bone here if you can see <laughs> <laughs> a little bit <laughs> thank you so much for that okay let's have a look of course there are a few questions left so uh, this is something you have mentioned during the presentation but how do we improve our microbiome the four the four stages from that society i mean uh this is the the basic thing that we should all do um i, I will i will tell you something okay what i will i will share with you something extra new is that i'm about to uh, receive um, an accreditation as a microbiome expert. I had to go back to the university because for me the microbiome in fertility is the next relevation in uh, the field of uh, fertility. So um, when I started studying about the microbiome, the first thing that I did, and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, wh wh where do I every day where am i having sugar from so uh, i could never believe how bad sugar is for the microbiome okay so the first thing if you want to start tomorrow just cut sugar i don't want you to cut sugar completely um even when i'm doing fertility coaching with my patients i don't i don't like you know a radical um radical uh, measures that say don't do this don't do that don't eat uh, sugar anymore don't 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 i prefer to work with do's so um say that you like to have some uh, organic uh, dark chocolate well, that is full with tryptophan and magnesium and it's good for uh, the endometrium and your mental health etc say that you're having some chocolate every afternoon all right along with some um, uh, almonds or um, walnuts uh you should not have and you will have some sugar there all right or you will you're going to have some uh, uh, honey, Reiki honey with uh, your um, tea. Um, I'm drinking my most favorite tea at the moment, the Organic Islands uh, Sage Tea. And I, I really want to share that, that because I really want you, I, I really want to put you in the mindset that everything that makes you happier and brings your stress down 
because of course I was stressed before the presentation. I'm always, I mean, I think I will, uh, I will be 80 years old and still be anxious before any presentation. So everything that makes you, everything that makes your stress go down, you should do it. So you can improve your microbiome by little steps every day. One day you reduce the sugar a bit. You go out for walking, even the 10 minutes, it's incredible, but even 10 minutes of walking every day has proven signs that can improve the microbiome. Then you try to improve your sleeping patterns. Then you try to put more prebiotic fiber in your um, nutrition protocol. Then you start having a yogurt every single day, little steps every day, and you're there. You, you can do it. I'm sure you can. All of you can. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, this is uh, amazing to hear and I love your uh, positive attitude in this as well. Thank you so much. And well, actually, you already kind of answered because there was a question in regards to sugar if it's uh, necessary to, to cut it out. But as you the mentioned... Compli the, completely, the completely protocols are, are not my favorite. The completely no protocols, I don't think that... Uh, uh, they are uh, sustainable over time. But you should cut out the sugar that is not necessary. You should cut down colas. You should uh, cut down uh, unwanted sweets. You can replace bad sweets with good sweets. And you know something, I I'll say with you something if I'm allowed from health coaching. Do you know that when you want something, when you crave something sweet, the brain can only understand that you have you give him you you give him yeah okay the brain is male all right so you give your brain something that is sweet they cannot the brain cannot understand if you're giving uh, it chocolate or uh, a very unhealthy sweet he, they it is the what is recognized is the sweet so gradually you can have some something that is sweet but it can be really healthy you can have a yogurt with live uh, bacteria inside with live cultures inside or live culture of bacteria inside and you can add some very good honey uh, that has inf ad inflammatory properties and there you have it or as i told you you can have uh, some nice uh, chocolate when you feel you want some comfort food but this chocolate needs to be of good quality with more than 70, 80% of cocoa beans uh, uh, inside and less sugar as possible. So no, I don't believe you should cut it completely unless there is a medical reason for you to do it. Excellent, thank you so much for that. And also again, this is something you've mentioned, but uh, this is like a whole message, yeah? So how long would it take to improve the... Uh, it's not only how long it would take to improve the endometrium microbiome, it also has to do with uh, what you can also improve. I mean, say that your endometrial microbiome is not so um, disturbed, but at the same time, you really need to improve the quality of your eggs. And, you know, I, I, I sometimes I hear this question and they say, oh, it's a like quality, quality, quality. We really need, um, it's, I feel that I'm the egg quality, the bad egg egg quality expert but what we really need to understand is that egg quality bad egg quality good egg quality it's not an independent factor i mean sometimes i have somebody that uh, okay they said to me oh we didn't succeed and we had a uh, multiple other failures because we had uh, um uh, very bad egg quality yes but at the same time you see that the sperm is not good as well. And at the same time, you see that uh, uh, the, the nutrition is bad, the patient is not sleeping uh, properly, uh, the working conditions are very, very stressful. Why don't we, don't we take the person as a whole and really address every single problem? Instead of just saying, okay, how do you improve egg quality? And uh, you can improve egg quality by, say, donor eggs, or uh, you can, but again, even if you're using donor eggs, if the general health of uh, the recipient uh, is uh, not good, again, you may fail. Even if um, 
egg uh, donor cycles may go up uh, 75 to 85 percent success rates so everything has to do with a good preparation and uh, what carlos simon said as an opportunity window three months before okay invest in that period of time and amazing again thank you so much for yet another question in the indeed all of those are very interesting and thank you for helping out and so do you recommend colonic hydrotherapy just before transfer <laughs> i don't have enough data to support that and i'm looking forward to new data coming probably in the next one or two years uh, i cannot uh, recommend something that um, I, I do not have enough uh, evidence scientific data to support it okay and generally speaking as again as a rule of thumb just before just before tra uh, transfer the best the only thing i do recommend is normal body function nothing really extra i mean you are doing a transfer you are stressed already what you need to do is eat properly sleep properly and cuddle um find uh, a supporting environment do not add things that cannot really have uh, a scientific evidence based uh, data that can support that they can really improve uh, uh, success rates before transfer because then then you're losing you do not really know what is working what has gone wrong and um, what you can do better the next time science reproductive science many times is much simpler than we actually think and try to uh, find more complicated things instead of the really basic ones i insist on the basic ones all right understood again thank you so much for that and let's have a look next question is up i have anxiety disorder but my gp doesn't want to prescribe anything i walk meditate practice yoga and lots of other things to try and manage anxiety but it, but it doesn't help yes i, think I should get to yes yes See, i mean i mean uh, the <laughs> If it, if it is, uh, if uh, the anxiety disorder uh, is something that disturbs everything, everything else and uh, you are already doing, walking, meditating, yoga, I mean, do you know something? Sometimes I, I have patients that do yoga because they believe that yoga and meditation helps them with uh, uh, stress management. Uh, because another friend may have done yoga or meditation for stress management and it's not working for them and then i just ask why aren't you changing what you're doing in order to uh, relieve your stress you cannot be you cannot live your life like that with all that stress every day and especially now with covid um we need to address every single problem, especially if it has to do with uh, anxiety disorder. And because I do believe that every single patient that accepts, accepts the fact that they have an anxiety disorder, they already have done the first step towards a better situation. So they really need to be supported by their doctor. And yes, I mean, if you're not happy with what you're getting up to now, just ask for a second or a third opinion. I don't believe in too many opinions. But in that case, if you believe that you have not found the solution to your problem, you just simply need to find the solution to your problem. Excellent. Excellent. Again, thank you so much. And next question, very short one. How do we check the microbiome? I collaborate I, I, I can uh, tell you what I'm doing uh, in our practice but uh, uh, there are more um, complex ways actually if you want to check the microbiome <laughs> um, what uh, we're doing what I'm doing I'm checking two things I'm doing a femoscan which is uh, uh, a test that is done like a vaginal can um, vaginal uh, a culture that we take uh, a specimen from the vagina 
all around and also the um, um, cervix deep inside and uh, we actually check for dysbiosis and uh, it's a very comprehensive test that uh, I collaborate with the pathophysiologist to perform this test and also I collaborate with a gastrointestinal uh, doctor uh, that uh, uh, he is also assessing my patients uh, if they have all these uh, symptoms that I mentioned before, the bloating and the diarrhea and the constipation and the fatigue, etc. And uh, I rely on his expertise in order to see if we need extra testing to see if uh, the gastrointestinal tract uh, is healthy or not. So I have those two uh, doctors that I collaborate uh, with them in order to check both the uh, reproductive microbiome and the gut intestinal microbiome. And when I get my answers and I know that uh, everything is clear or I have dysbiosis or I have uh, uh, inflammation of the gut or uh, um, of the gut or the stomach, uh, then we apply all the evidence-based protocols in order to uh, improve the microbiome with probiotics and uh, differentiations in the nutrition. And again, these four uh, steps that I mentioned already above. <coughs> and wonderful ones again. Thank you a lot. And uh, it looks like we do have like two final questions and we will be finishing. And so if you have any left, just go ahead and type those in right now. And let's have a look at the next that we have. I had the neck retrieval today and only got 5M2 and 1M1X, short protocol, I'm 41, and two and a half years ago, I did an egg retrieval and got 34X, long protocol, so I'm really disappointed today. If this fails, shall I go for the long protocol next time, or do I need to change clinics? Okay. Um... So, the first question is uh, if there is um, two and a half, go 30, yes, but, okay, there are many questions here from my side as well. Well, first of all, first of all is uh, how many of the 34 eggs uh, were actually mature and how many resulted in uh, embryos and what happened and after 34 eggs, there is no pregnancy. I mean, uh, I mean, if you if you think twenty three could be frozen, twenty three, but but we had no we had no pregnancy, right? There ah okay, they are still in the freezer. All right, so <coughs> no, first, it's not about disappointment because uh, it's not really about disappointment because every single cycle and this is something that women need to understand is that every single menstrual cycle, not IVF cycle, every single menstrual, menstrual cycle has its own characteristics and its own hormonal profile that uh, it starts and uh, it goes uh, along the 28, 30 days. Um, and one thing that we do know is that now I'm going to speak about quality one thing that we really know is it doesn't really matter about how many um, embryos you may have, how many eggs you may have. It matters, the number matters because we do know that after, uh, if you have 15 to 18 uh, good uh, embryos, one of those would uh, uh be a successful pregnancy so this these are the statistics that we know up to now that every 15 every 18 or one every 25 eggs uh can be the one that will support uh, a pregnancy um, a successful um procedure and a pregnancy uh to term so i wouldn't be disappointed it all has to do uh with uh, the whole situation. I mean, I do not know why uh, you still have uh, so many um, 
eggs not used and um, it's not that the long protocol will be so much successful the next time as well the reality is that if you can be sure that in the in if you use the long protocol you will get eggs i personally prefer and my husband personally prefers uh, the long protocol over the short protocol uh, it, it goes more smoothly with um, the ovarian uh, cycle but you cannot be sure that after the age of um, 40, 41 that you are now, you cannot really be sure that the long protocol will really be successful. So if you came to me, I do believe that I would also go for the short protocol myself. If this fails, it's, it has to do with what your doctor knows with your medical history and how your hormones are the last cycles. I mean, if you're ovulating properly and if your FSH is right and if you still have a good army, regardless of uh, the advanced reproductive age, I would do it, okay? But it would be more risky compared to the short protocol. Uh, I cannot answer that do I need to change clinics again. I do not believe that changing clinics every every if uh, one IVF fails is a good thing because it adds extra frustration as well and I really believe that you really need to build the trust with um, the doctor that uh, is looking after you and you're trying to have a baby together that that's more personal I cannot really I cannot answer I cannot really answer that but um, I would really discuss all protocols with you. I would explain uh, the good uh, uh, things that could happen and the bad things that we that could happen. And if you would be ready to accept failure as well, I would do it if I really believe that probably for you would be the good thing to do, the right thing to do, the personalized thing to do. Thank you indeed so much for uh, your advice on that uh, as well. Okay, and let's have a look. As I mentioned, it looks like this now will be our final question for uh, today. No, sorry, there are two more. Uh, so let me just go straight to this one. So should we completely stop eating cheese to improve a microbiome? Hmm. No. Uh, um, if you can be, I mean, say there are some cheese that actually, I mean, um, recently, in my social media during the quarantine i started i had the time to to cook more so i started um uh sharing some of my fertility uh, because i do believe as i told you in real nutrition i also do believe in supplements and i love supplements but i don't like supplements only i like fertility nutrition and supplements and probiotics so actually there are some cheeses out there like uh, Roquefort um, and um, that can help your microbiome uh, and there, there's this Greek food, the Greek cheese called Katiki and uh, I am sure that there are, if you Google, um, if you Google uh, because you know you can find cheese that actually have uh, live uh, cultures inside. So uh, I would suggest that if there are no other contraindications, uh, I don't think that you should completely stop eating cheeses. Uh, but because cheese has um, uh, a very high fat content and uh, sometimes, uh, well, now we, we go into another section, but uh, anyway, um, sometimes you do not want to have uh, other hormones coming from uh, animal fat, uh, that can possible probably that can probably disturb uh, the estradiol uh, balance in a woman's body. Then, if you just eat everything in moderation, it would not do any harm. Okay, I mean I think that is the best advice that I could give. Everything you eat in moderation, and try to find if you love to eat cheese. Because if you are posing this question, I understand that you probably love that. Try to find the cheese that works 
for you, not against you. Wonderful. Thank you once more, of course, for that. And uh, well, as I mentioned now, it looks like that will be our final question for tonight. So let's have a look at it. Thank you so much for this enlightening presentation. You mentioned a parameter to be hormone. So my query is when going through menopause, should also microbiome be checked being a negative issue for bad morphology endometrium in the event of implantation of embryos? What can someone do in that case? Wow, this is the best audience I could ever have. So this question, I think I should also write it in my blog. <coughs> okay, <coughs> microbiome and uh, menopause, very, very big connection. Okay, because, because of menopause and uh, because of uh, perimenopause and menopause, that you have all this drop in estradiol levels on, and all this imbalance in the hormones, microbiome is directly affected. Okay, so this is one of the first things you should actually look after when you are going through this phase in uh, your life. But I really want you to understand, all of you, that th this is why I mentioned that over and over again, that it's not only if you have this and probably a little bit expensive test to check your microbiome don't don't bother so much about that about testing 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 as i told you there are also more uh, medical ways to test the microbiome through endometrial biopsies and specialized uh, cultures and um, PCR and next generation sequencing for uh, the genome of the microbes. I mean, trust me, uh, this biotechnology and uh, new science is uh, extremely, uh, it's growing so fast that we have at least five, six, ten different uh, ways to actually check dysbiosis and check the microbiome in the endometrium, in the vagina, in uh, in uh, the stomach and um, the gut. Uh, the thing that I really want you to understand is that besides testing, start implementing parameters that will actually improve the microbiome anyhow. Okay, so not only should also micro be checked don't check it start doing things to improve it anyway especially if you are in perimenopause or going through menopause already okay it by fact because of the fact that menopausal um hormonal uh, menopause hormonal abnormalities affect the microbiome they 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 even affect there is a uh, there is a new science that has to do with menopause and the microbiome in the oral cavity. I mean, this is how much menopause is affected by uh, how menopause and the alterations in the hormonal balances affect the microbiome. So if you're going through this phase, start, uh, start implementing procedures that will improve your microbiome even if you do not check it. What can someone do in that case, please? The four stages that I mentioned above. Have those four stages as rule of thumb. And amazing. Thank you so much for indeed an interesting question and of course for your answer. In the meantime, one more question is shown right here, so I guess we can still have a look at it. So how long before a frozen embryo transfer is it important to eat healthy? Okay, uh, important, like before you were uh, having a really unhealthy diet or, I mean, you, we should always eat healthy. We, we should always eat healthy with, with a little bit of unhealthy, okay? So it's really important to always eat healthy. You have to understand that you are not eating healthy because you are having an embryo transfer. It doesn't matter if it's frozen or it's in a fresh uh, cycle. You need to understand that you are eating healthy because you are the first person you really think to look after before anything else. So you eat healthy because you deserve to eat healthy. You deserve the best. 
you deserve to be in your best position available. So start eating healthy, even if you're not going to do a frozen embryo transfer. But because you're doing a frozen embryo transfer, start this journey towards a successful pregnancy. Start thinking like I have been dying for a year and I was hoping for a little break. Okay, so dieting like strict dieting, if I understand. Okay, so nutrition, great question, great, great thing that you are saying that and you are sharing this uh, with us. It's very interesting. It's very good that you are sharing. Thank you for that. Uh, a, a fertility diet, although we say the word diet, it's not a diet, it's a nutrition. So you cannot really have a break for a good, from a good nutrition. You can have a break from a diet if you are on a very hard diet. But if you're eating properly and if you're having a great nutrition, then you just do not need to break it because you are already doing it. It's a routine. While you are having good habits, good nutritional habits, it is okay if you want to have a sweet or even a glass of wine or something. Trust me, a glass of wine, I hate wine, I hate drinking, I hate alcohol, I, I hate alcohol consumption during uh, IVF procedures because it's, it, it, it destroys the microbiome, it uh, provokes hormonal imbalances, it has high toxicity, generally speaking, Pregnancy and alcohol, no. Trying to conceive an alcohol, no. So uh, even that, if you want to have one glass of wine, that would not be the reason of not having a successful um, frozen embryo transfer. But if you're having an embryo transfer, uh, and you say, okay, but now, okay, whatever, done, whatever is done is done and let's order pizzas and let's have, and you can have your own, you can create your own healthy pizza. Uh, or let's take every day from uh, delivery and, oh, I'm not, uh, don't want to have uh, any water, let's uh, drink some colas. I mean, don't do that. Just eat properly, basic stuff. Fruits, vegetables, water, good protein and that it's not for a break this is a routine you should be at an amazing thank you so much indeed for this and it looks like that was our final question so thank you everyone for your questions because that definitely those were very interesting and Harula, you've been brilliant with answering them and thank you so much for as i've mentioned before this positive attitude love it for sure and well you can see that there are many many things uh, excellent presentation and some comments interesting presentation thank you thank you i thank you and um, before I let you go, as you can see, there are more of those. Uh, <laughs> anything else you would like to add? Okay. Uh, my philosophy after, um, but, but I really don't want to go to burst into tears. I'm a bit, um, you know, uh, emotionally overwhelmed at the moment. Um, you know, <laughs> the reason that I studied those, those two extra fields, health coaching and microbiome, uh, the microbiome science, of course, it was for me to help my patients in their fertility journey. But the more, the deeper I dive into science, the deeper I dive into science, uh, I realize that the most important thing is to always remember the basics. Remember that we need to eat a healthy diet, we need to sleep well, we need to stay hydrated, we need to find ways to be happy and have a positive attitude in life, we need to find ways to have great mental strength. So before going to all these extra demanding, extra scientific, trust me, 
I can perform the the most uh, um, uh, the, 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 the rarest and the most crazy diagnostic test for unexplained IVF. I have all the technology in my heart, but those this technology, if the patient cannot just enjoy life, be a human being, be somebody with the need to eat properly and sleep and uh, share love, share happiness, have mental health. No matter how much technology have, next generation sequencing, um, uh, PGDs, uh, modern drugs, these do not have any luck if the patient is not a patient that can be happy and strong in his in his or her body in her mind in her heart so put yourselves as priority and accept the fact that for me and for everybody in the ivf industry family first and before anything else is the couple any child adds a new member to the already existing family all right so look after yourself first and uh, never forget the basics. And what else can I add to that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much. And it's been great to have you here. You saw the comments. So again, thank you um, again, everyone, for joining us tonight, for spending this uh, evening, Friday <laughs> with us and of course remember it has been recorded so you will have a chance to watch this once again it will be available on our website myivfnc.com and also on our youtube channel and as you know we will be back here on monday at 8 p.m uk time so i do hope to see you and harula once again huge thank you have a lot thank you very much everyone and i do uh, believe that uh, there are more and more of those events coming up with you as well so i'm already looking forward to this for sure thank you so much thank Take you care, everyone good night good night <laughs> and good day wherever you are thank you so much <laughs> thank bye. you good night bye bye